Hey, this week, rather than looking backwards at the weekend message, we're gonna look forward to the upcoming series because I don't know that we've ever done a weirder series than this. The rhino, the bison, and the lamb. Now look, it's got biblical precedent because we're looking at three animals that teach us how to live out our faith. And even Solomon in the book of Proverbs said, look at the ant you sluggard or look at the hyrax. There's biblical reason to look for animals as examples of how we should live. And that's what we're doing in this series. But it is, it is kind of unexpected. It kind of came out of a weird discussion in our annual planning meeting. We just started talking about a rhino and some of his attributes and a bison and some of his attributes. And we said, hey, what? We could do a whole series on that. So that's, that's kind of the, the backstory of this. But I, I want to take this opportunity to do a four-week study in our groups on faith. Because in the weekend, we're going to look at animals. In, in, the, in our discussion, I really want to dig into some scripture, biblical studies on faith. And it's interesting, faith is the only word in the Bible that's actually defined by the Bible. I suppose you could throw in love as well. First Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind. But faith, we have a classic dictionary definition. Here's what it says, Hebrews chapter 11, verse one. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The problem with that definition is those two words of assurance and conviction, we don't even know quite how to translate those words because they, they could have several meanings. For, for example, here's the King James translation. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I think the best translation for my money is the NLT, New Living Translation. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Now, let me, let me try to unpack those two terms. The first word, reality, in a, it was used in a medical sense of sediment. So if you had like bodily fluids and then you left them in a beaker and the, the sediment down at the bottom, that's the foundation, that's the settling. In a philosophic world, it was used for substance, something that uh, like became reality, not just an idea, but actually a concrete reality. In the theological term, it means the foundation, the basis of what we believe. And based upon that definition, well, as, as well as the word evidence, the, the Greek word for evidence is pragma, from which we get pragmatic. So it's like the real practical nature of it. Now, based upon that definition, I want to say four things about faith that might be a little surprising. First, hope is future. Faith is past. Now, a lot of people think about faith as hope, that I hope this happens. No, hope is what you do not see. Faith is what you see. Now, I realize the verse itself says, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. We don't see, ultimately, God, in whom we put our faith. But we do see the world he created. That's past. We may not see the Holy Spirit, but we see the work of the Holy Spirit in our own lives and the lives of others. We may not see the resurrection of Jesus, but we have the documents that describe for us the historic resurrection of Jesus. That's why I say our faith, which hopes in the future, is actually based upon what we have seen in the past, even though the object of our faith, God the Father, we've not seen him, but we have seen the evidence, the substance of him all around us. That's the first surprising thing about faith. So how does, here's the question for us. How does this alter how you have thought about faith?
The second thing I wanna say about faith is that faith is a relationship with God. Now, often we think of faith as this is what I do for God. It's actually a relationship with God. The Hebrew word for faith, if you go back to the Old Testament, is emeth, and it's a covenant loyalty. You can't have biblical faith without two parties believing in and showing loyalty to one another. It's not just about me to God. It's about God with me and me responding to God and then God responding to me. And that's why Hebrews 11, if you go from Hebrews 11.1 1 to Hebrews 11.6, it says, it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. So let's ask this question around the circle. Why do you think it is impossible to please God without faith? Is this true of other relationships like your marriage, kids, or coworkers?
The third surprising aspect of faith, and this is not as surprising as the others, I suppose, faith is modeled. In other words, it's not just your own relationship with God, but you learn faith from others. In Hebrews 11, it's one of the most famous chapters of all the Bible. Some have called it, rightly, the hall of fame of the faith. And it just goes through biblical history. It doesn't start with Adam, but it starts with Adam's son, Abel, in verse four, and say, look at the faith that Abel had to offer God a sacrifice. Enoch, verse five. Noah, verse seven. Abraham, verses eight through 20. He's a big one. And in fact, if you wanna really learn about what faith is like, Abraham is the best biblical model of any other character of what faith looks like. Along with his wife, Sarah, verse 11. His son, Isaac, verse 20 grandson, Jacob, great-grandson, Joseph, Moses, verse 23 through 30, he's another big one, Uh, Abraham, Moses, David, those are the three big characters of the Old Testament, and then another woman, Rahab, who wasn't even a Jew. She was a Canaanite, and the reason I bring that up is because there are some in the circle who are thinking, you know, you look around, you go, man, everyone else is more spiritual than I am, and I'm not sure I belong in here, and just might be uncomfortable. Stop it. Stop it because Rahab was a prostitute pagan who saw God, and she saw the faithfulness of God to Israel, and she said, I wanna be part of that. And if you feel like an outsider looking in, you can be an insider by giving your faith in God. The beautiful thing about this Hall of Fame of the Faith is it's it's everybody. It's men, it's women, it's rich, it's poor, it's Jews, it's pagans. And then we get this barrage in, in, in the end of the chapter, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, he just like machine guns this out of all these famous people in the faith. And some of them are, are not even in the Bible. It talks about a guy being sawn in two. That's not in the Bible. 
or people in caves or people uh, get, receiving their dead back by faith. There are so many stories, both in the Bible and outside of the Bible and ancient literature that talk about people who live their faith. And here's the point, that your faith is a lineage with other people. So I wanna ask this question. Who was a great model of faith in your life? What did they do that demonstrated real faith? Thank you. 
The fourth thing I want to say about faith is probably the most surprising of all, that faith is a continuation of a heritage. Typically, again, we think about faith as me giving faith to God, but it's more than that. It's me having a relationship with God and a relationship with people in my past who have led me to the place of my own faith. I want to read a passage that kind of concludes this chapter that is stunning. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith. Yet none of them received all that God had promised, for God had something better in mind for us so that they would not reach perfection without us. That word perfection should be maybe translated completion. Abraham, he's incomplete without CCB. Moses is incomplete without your neighborhood group. David is incomplete without your family. Why? Why? Because faith is a, it's a long distance race where the baton is passed from one person to another over generation after generation. And I believe that we are at a critical generation right now where faith is jeopardized because we're spun out of control in all these different directions and we're replacing biblical faith with political platforms or social issues. The truth is, the only thing that has mattered to the history of this world that will go into eternity is the life of Jesus Christ and his transformative power person by person by person. And we dare not substitute any other agenda or any other platform, but the hope that we have by God's faithfulness in the past, modeled by the likes of Abraham, David, Moses, and now you. And that's why here at CCV, we're gonna focus on faith in Jesus Christ and passing that baton to our next generation. That's why it's such a priority for us, for our student ministries and kids' ministries, and why, why we would encourage you so strongly to be a part of that and volunteering in those areas, because the faith that we live is not just the faith we receive, it's the faith we pass on to others. And this is a serious question I think we all need to grapple with. What could be the consequence of our generation failing in faith? Are we in danger of that?
All right, let's bring it to a point. Because without application, there is no point. What are you personally challenged to do this week to strengthen your faith that you can then pass on? Thank you.
Thank you. 